Hi, Karen. Hi. Hello, everybody. How are we doing? Good. 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 Good to see you all. Good to see. Oh, I love this moment Hi, when I get to just look at everybody's face. It's fantastic. Ah, oh, I love it. It's oh, giving you all hugs. So good to see everybody. Really good. Um, so welcome to uh, part two. We're not going to be repeating much of what we talked about in the first three classes, but instead we're going to be building upon it. But for emphasis and for those of you who have uh, memories like sieves, like me, we're going to just go over a couple of what I consider to be the highlights from the last three classes. And the reason I want to punch those two home again is simply because they really are the basis for everything that we speak about tonight and the basis of what we speak about for any particular topic at any time. Okay. So basically, if you um, recall, we talked about in the first series of three, we talked about three different things that are essential for our well being and moving forward. And basically, um, the, the foundation for enlightenment, awakening, and awareness. And the two that I want to emphasize today, since they're so relevant to what's going on today, but relevant for any period in our life with anything at all that's going on personally or globally. So that what I want to emphasize then is number one, got my favorite marker. This is the one that I like better. I'm using a headset tonight for those of you who have noticed to try to help with the, the voice. Okay, so um, I'm going to try not to shout. I'm trying to talk in a normal tone. That's what I was instructed to do. Speak in a normal tone and stop projecting. That's what I'm doing. Okay, um, number one, it's the realization and the recall that, um, that we are eternal. And the reason that I'll emphasize this one so much is that every time we have difficulty processing or accepting or managing something that's going on around us. One of the things that we're doing is we're getting too fused with the story of our lives, of the lives of others, of what we are perceiving as consequence, of what we are perceiving as fear. And when we become too much a part of believing that the story is the, the fact and that we're not here for a bigger reason or a bigger picture, um, we, we start to take all of those experiences very personally. And even the fear of whatever we might be seeing <coughs> around us becomes something that can pull us down and anchor us. And it makes it very hard for us to soar when we're feeling anchored by the human experience. So simply as the turning point in my particular life for when I was able to go from um, drab to fab. Oh, I like that, right? That sounds pretty cool, right? From drab to fab, it's more of an internal thing. But to go from drab to fab, the number one thing that changed in my life was that I recognized and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt now that we are eternal. So <laughs> our consciousness is projecting into the space, creating our individual reality, as well as creating the global reality with everyone else. And if during um, unusual periods like this, if people are going down and they're going down, we actually don't have to sink with them. We don't have to go down with them. We can soar and we can stay above the line. So the number one, I would consider to be the most significant element of enlightenment that can help us during Corona, but help us during any period of our lives whatsoever is to recall and live as if we are eternal, okay? What I gave in the last three classes as a quick reminder was I gave you a tool to help you get into the state of consciousness where you're actually viscerally remembering that you are eternal, having a physical feeling of connectedness with source, with the universe, or with your guides. You know, some people like to think of... Um, practicing yoga or meditating as a way to get to that space, whatever it is that you use to make you be able to get back into that space of really truly feeling, feeling connected, feeling like you are eternal, feeling like this journey is far more um, meaningful and not necessarily scary. You want to keep 
practicing your method for knowingly connected. Keep practicing your method. Keep practicing, okay? So that was the first one. The second one was um, two. And we're, we're going to talk about a, this one a little bit more, but I just wanted to put it up as a reminder because it is the other most single, um, sig most significant element of what we talked about in the last three sessions. It's to find the benefits. When you understand that you are a soul having a physical experience, you start to recognize more that all of your experiences are uh, in embedding opportunities for you to discover something that you forgot. It's designed to help you remember. It's designed to help you to grow. It's designed to help you get rid of earth amnesia. It's designed to help you to live as if we are free from the encumbrances of the earthly conversation, getting back to being souls in pure form in this human journey. So every time you have something that's challenging, it's, it's important to contemplate what's the value in this? What's the value for me personally? What's the value for us all together? Um, a lot of times over the last 10 years, I've talked mainly about the individual benefits of challenges that happen for us. So we focused a lot on individual abundance, um, individual relationships, individual relationship with ourselves. We've talked about self-love. We've talked about um, relationship with our body and our body harmony. So we've spoken very, very often about growth in our individual banana peel. Like how do we make um, as much harmony as possible as we can within this particular skin. And we've talked about that. And when we've had 10 years worth of tools, many of which are on my website in essays or um, in happy and 90 and in my books and in, in on my YouTube channel and a lot of the seminars. So there's a lot to review there. We're not going to go over all of it fundamentally. But one of the reasons for Corona right now is to take the individual growth that we've experienced. And most people who have found me or have worked with me or we've kind of been magnetized to each other in some way or another, most people have already experienced certain levels of enlightenment. So it's sort of like um, you already know that you are potentially farther along than the general population. And if that's the case and you understand it, and that means that a lot of the things we've spoken about, whether or not you just met me yesterday or you met me 10 years ago, but a lot of the things that we talk about, about the pathway of enlightenment, that you've experienced so much personal growth and development already. You're going to continue on that path of personal growth and development, but what we're also going to be focusing on through Corona is how do we take the benefits of this period and Yes, continue to grow individually, but how do we now take this and how do we move forward into other spaces? Because it's no longer um, enough for us to be living on the planet as singular individuals, having growth and additional relationship harmony and body harmony and so on. It's We're clearly at a space in collective awareness where those who have developed some individual awakeness or enlightenment, it's time for us to be more purposeful in how we implement possibilities and suggestions for other people. Purpose. So it doesn't mean that at this second, you're done. You know, oh, I've got, you know, all the money I need. I got all the love I want. I, I'm totally happy and I'm done. And now that I've got all this, I want to move it into trying to help other people. That's not how enlightenment works any more than expertise in any area works. If I worked in a university and I was a professor, I don't have to be able to teach economics in order to teach perhaps um, what else is there besides economics? Can't think of one other subject. <laughs> Women's history. Whoa, good one, Karen. <laughs> I don't have to be a master 
at art in order to teach music. I don't have to be a master in music in order to teach social sciences. Yet when we're thinking about how we can be of value to other people, we tend to set the spiritual bar really high for ourselves. And we don't necessarily understand how powerful we are as beings and being able to exact information of value to others while we're still learning and becoming experts in other areas in our own life. So in other words, you don't have to be in total harmony and you don't have to be perfect because none of us are perfect and none of, none of us will ever be perfect, I really, really hope, because there's no such thing. But wherever you are right now, this period of history is clearly calling us, anyone that has information that can help to guide other people, to try to just come forth with it a little bit more. So in addition to finding benefits for yourself, as we've always done, we also want to start to add in a dash of how does Corona benefit others and how might I introduce the possibility of how this period can be helpful or beneficial to other people, okay? Um, for those of you who were, let me take a peek at all of you for a second and I can look around. Um, I can see that a lot of you were, oh, look, hi, I love seeing your faces. Um, a lot of you were in Grenada on the kickoff trip for 2020, and uh, the year before us as took place on that trip. And one of the things that came forth on that trip, there, are, there were a lot of you there. I think that's so cool to see your faces. We're having like a mini reunion here. Um, but one of the things that really came forth was the fact that there would be a, a large global event. And I think I explained that there was a big wave coming. Um, the big wave is here. The big wave was coming. But what we discovered was that as long as you have the um, intention to become aware and awake and aware of yourself as a soul and your role in the space of humanity, as long as you start to wear the lens of viewing things in a loving way, in a softer way, and you have the intention to be of value in assisting others along the journey, and then to continue the wake up process yourself, as long as you had that basic intention and some basic development there, then as this wave is coming through, then you have the surfboard and you have the skill set to ride the wave. Okay. And what that means is that you can enjoy the ride. You don't actually have to be pulled down into the wave, but you can't be of value to other people if you spin in the wave with them. Okay. There's a reason that you've gotten the training where you know how to, to ride that wave. There's a reason that you're here. You cannot help other people if you're tumbling in the wave and your face is smashing the bottom of the ocean and then it's coming up and then you're going down and then you're swallowing water. Can't help anybody. So the key is to continue to stay above, ride that crest. And as we're moving along, every time you have an opportunity to be of value to someone, to throw them um, a, a life raft, to throw them something, to help them when you're on shore, to teach them how to surf. Every time you can be of value, then you offer in introductions and information that shows how you got to be one that rides the wave, okay? So in Grenada, you know, we, we clearly talked about that there was a global wave coming and the global wave is here. Right now, we also talked about deconstructing. Um, deconstructing is the period that we are in right now so visibly where we are breaking down systems that are no longer serving us. We're breaking down archaic institutions, archaic, archaic um, organizations, archaic methods, uh, ways of doing things that we continue to do just because we've always done them. Now, during this reconstruction and this deconstruction process, um, a lot of people will be scared. A lot of people will be terrified. A lot of people will have a hard time imagining what the future will be for them personally. So they're usually fearing for their relationship with abundance, their relationship with their bodies. They're worried about their health, um, but they're worried mostly about they have a great fear of the unknown. So in one of the things I want to talk about tonight is 
you know, we're, we're looking toward how do we stay connected? How do we stay connected? But how do we also experience the projection of our own individual realities that are abundant? How do we nurture our relationships with our bodies? How do we, how do we put a mindset out there and vibrational energy out there that creates abundance in our lives? How do we create self-perpetuating abundance in a fearless way, regardless of all of the indicators out there that the new paradigm might make it difficult to experience abundance? So as we're moving forward, what we want to continue to do is feel our connectedness to the universe, continue your personal journey, whether it's auto writing, hiking in nature, the system that I gave you during the last three classes, meditating, yoga, whatever it is. When you feel it, you know it. When you don't, you also know it, okay? Keep finding the benefits in every one of your experiences. And from this platform, we can use our vibrational energy to create abundance um, and harmony. When we are operating from a place of abundance and harmony, and what it is that I talked about, this riding the top of the wave and providing value to other people, when we are whole, we have energy to contribute. When we are depleted, we don't have anything to give to anybody, okay? So let's talk about how can you thrive at a time in history where there's no frame of reference we don't have any really big known about what this will be like. Um, how can you thrive? How can you soar? How can you um, expect and appreciate that abundance in all of the ways that it is that you want are there for you and will continue to be there for you? I just want to point out that I do have the chat room open. And in a few minutes, I will stop and pause and take questions. I'll ask if anybody wants to raise their hand, but I'll also look at questions in the chat room. So feel free to type them in while I'm speaking. And then also when I pause, um, I, there are a couple of questions in there I'm trying to answer from people who wrote to me privately. Okay. <coughs> so I'll continue with that too. Um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I have been... Uh, unwavering in explaining that we project our energy into the universe and then we receive back the byproduct of that energy, the echo of that energy. Um, we are all doing it individually. And then our energy among all people collect. So we're all projecting consciousness out creating this physical manifestation. And then we're all accepting and receiving and interpreting the echo back from that projection. This is a time when it becomes imperative for us to become aware of what we think, what we feel, what we believe, and then the subsequent actions that we take based on what we're thinking and feeling and believing. There is no other thing that is creating our reality other than that. And for those of you who might have forgotten it, it seems like I say it so often, it's kind of hard to forget at this point, but I'll just jot them down one more time because they are the basis of the creation of reality. Um, think, feel, believe, and then subsequent actions based on what we're thinking and feeling and believing. So these are the four energies that create our reality. Now, when we become frightened, it's very easy to see ourselves in a role of receiving the consequence of what's going on in the world. But we're not. We are still co-creating. We may have less influence on our day-to-day -day experiences because there's now seven people 7 billion people co-creating the reality that we're in the middle of, but we still are casting our projection into this reality and co-creating the reality with everyone. If you are even somewhat enlightened, if you have some awakening, some soulful connection to who you were before you were born, that means that your star 
the vibration of you is shining more than the stars of other people. So when you put forth what you think and what you feel and what you believe and the subsequent actions that you have, it has a greater impact on your community, your family, your, your town, your city, your state, your country, and the entire globe than a person who's vibrating at a smaller vibration. So just by that equation, almost mathematically, whatever it is you're putting your energy toward is going to have a greater impact on the global reality of all humanity. But even though you're in the middle of a global thing, you still have major impact of these four energies on what you are experiencing, whether you're living in scarcity, whether you're living in poor health, whether you're living in um, depleted relationships, or if you're living in vibrancy and harmony and abundance and good health, these still are far more a, a consequence of your four energies than they are of the globe's energies. One of the things that's um, difficult as we watch the news and so on, uh, first I just want to read this because I think this is pretty cute. Somebody wrote in, oh, um, I think I'm allowed to share this even though it was pro private, but one person wrote that uh, her daughter wrote on a homework assignment, life is like a tsunami, ride the wave and don't get tumbled in it. Wow. I don't know if she's nine or if she's 11 or if she's 13, but I think I just found my new apprentice. And if you could just kind of like send her my way, I could always use a little bit of help. I could use a lot of help. <laughs> send her on over. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love that. That's amazing. Life, that's so funny. Okay. So anyway, I got sidetracked again. I always do that, right? So what was I talking about? Thinking and feeling and believing and abundance and, oh, okay. So well, as we're watching the news and, and trust me, to this day, I haven't watched one minute. I haven't seen one second of news. Uh, a lot of you have spoken to me by phone or been in touch with me. So, you know, I have a pretty good idea of what's going on, but I don't listen to the news. So I know what's going on, but I don't listen to the news. But those who are staying in that place where, they're watching the news and they're getting the daily counts and they're getting statistics and they're getting how, um, how long you have to wait, where the virus dies, where it lives, who's dying, who's getting better. Well, they don't talk that much about who's getting better. But was, as we're listening to all of this, one of the things that a lot of people just simply aren't aware of is that we're really affecting our, our belief system. Um, we're feeding ourselves information that doesn't ignite healthfulness and vibrancy. It doesn't ignite the immune system. It doesn't ignite our own innate ability to be within a um, banana peel or within a human experience that actually supports our journey and supports our pathway to happiness. So when you are listening and, and feeling um, all of the sadness for people, if you really submerge yourself in there and you bombard yourself with that on, on a regular basis and every day and, you know, hours a day, or it's in the background and that energy is still in your space or the people you love are living in that place. It is really literally like throwing, um, it's like throwing stones at yourself. You are dampening all of your resistance. You are putting a stress on your body and your mind, your spirit, all of you is becoming depleted it is actually becoming more likely for you to, um, to actually have the illness or any illness or any body disharmony because you've put yourself in a state where your natural defenses are subdued, they're quieted, they're feared. The, 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 the cells in your body that you're feeding are not the defensive ones, but they're the ones that are... Um, eating the healthy cells. Those are the ones that you're paying attention to. It's got that aggression energy that feels like the sick are going to win over the healthy. So that's the first thing that you want to think about is, you know, we might pay a lot of attention to my relationship with my body is about how I exercise or I sleep or 
um, what I eat and I, I eat clean and I do this and this is what I do and I'm going to live forever because I have these habits. But we're not paying attention to what we're feeding our souls necessarily as much. We're not paying attention to what we're feeding our thoughts as much. When you shift toward thinking that life is good and life is balanced and life is fluid and life is meant to be harmonious and fulfilled, when you shift from there to being afraid and being afraid of being sick and afraid of dying and afraid of illness and afraid of all of this, you can't eat enough healthy food on this planet to keep yourself completely resilient. There's not enough healthy uh, nutrients anywhere to keep you, to yourself healthy. You have to think in terms of what you put in front of your eyes, what you put into your ears is eating. You are still feeding yourself. You're still feeding your systems. What you take in becomes you. It doesn't pass through you. It becomes you. It might sound like we're lacking in compassion if we're not solving for people who are having awful experiences. But once again, if you're tumbling in the wave, you can't be of value to anybody. We can't have everybody weak and expect everybody to help each other when we're all weak. It just doesn't work like that. Those who know how to strengthen their selves are going to be the ones that reconstruct our physical manifestation after the deconstruction process is over. We need people who are still standing, who are standing beacons, who are standing in vibrancy, who are standing in possibility. That's the people who are going to be building the future, the future of what it is we all live among, okay? But the other part of this is um, by paying a lot of attention to the news, there's, a, there's an aspect that science hasn't paid any attention to yet. It's not being reported in the news because we just don't give it any credence yet. And what that is, is, um, and I don't mean to sound clinical about something that is, it's, you know, it's hard when somebody gets sick, it's hard when somebody dies, and I'm not trying to be clinical about it. But if somebody has an illness and they, and they die, or somebody has the same illness and they live, there's something we're not doing at all. We're not saying, what was this person thinking, feeling, believing, and what were the actions that they were taking in their lives? So we're making up statistics. Oh, if you're over 80, oh, if you're over 75, oh, if you've had this, oh, if you've had that, oh, if you've had this. So we're making up stats to pretend we understand the science of it but it doesn't really indicate anything. Could it be that it's more likely that someone over 80 that contracts the illness and then they die, maybe it's just their soul's way of saying, this next chapter is out of my scope of um, frame of reference or what I'm ready to give you know, 10 years of energy toward co-creating. Maybe on some unconscious level, they're like, you know what, my chapter is done. I feel pretty good about exiting now and giving opportunities for people to wake up on this planet and I'm perfectly okay going home. Of course, it's all unconscious. No one's actually thinking this. No one's thinking this about their parents or their grandparents or their loved ones. No one thinks like this. But on a soul level, maybe it's okay. You know, maybe there'll be a day when everyone here is like, you know what, I feel so good about my life, my experiences, this path for my soul in this finite length of time I've been on the planet. I feel like I've extricated all of the mutual benefit here. The planet's gotten a lot from me and I've gotten a lot from the planet. And I actually really am just ready to go home and I happily hand this off. I pass the torch on to the next generation. Okay. So first of all, we're not saying, we're not asking people, what does it feel like to be in your 80s? Um, do you feel like you want to be here another 20 years? Do you enjoy being a part of this major chaining po uh, changing point in humanity? Um, do you feel optimistic about what's to come after the virus has settled? So we're not having these conversations. We're also not reflecting on a person's state of mind either. Uh, is this a person who tends to be 
happy, excited, um, generally optimistic? Um, do they have a relationship that's harmonious with their body? Do they have an optimistic view of their own reality or the next leg of their own journey? Do they feel like the universe has supported them even though they've had trying times, but do they see growth and do they see increases in their own happiness? So do they see a future for themselves that seems to be getting better and better? Do they have the ability to look at other people who are struggling and see it as separate from themselves in regard to every person's soul path is being experienced in their individual journey as a reflection of what they're feeling, thinking, and believing? Can they see that somebody else can get sick but that doesn't necessarily mean that I will get sick, nor does it mean that they're a bad person if they get sick or that there's anything wrong with them. But are we interviewing anyone? Have we ever interviewed people about disease? Have we ever gotten into their mindset? Have we ever gotten into whether they are depressed or they are excited? Are they passionate or are they reticent? Are they withdrawn or are they forward? Are they optimistic and co-creating a happy reality or do they feel in the role of a victim? Do they cry for every person that has a struggle or do they say, I, I feel love for you and I will contribute in any way that I can, but I'm, I can't necessarily come down to that level of, um, of sadness that you're living in. So it's not until we actually get into figuring out what people are doing with their energy that we can truly make any sense out of what appears to be randomness. And this is a unifying opportunity for us to take science at, into the next level and really understand energy. We're treating every single thing on this planet right now like it's random, but there's nothing random. I find it so amazing that we can have the most amazing science uh, minds in the world proving that everything is purposeful. Chaos theory has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's nothing random. So we can take this amazing branch of science and so many other sciences um, like, like quantum science that support the idea that consciousness is projecting our reality and that there's no such thing as, as time and space and that this, you, you know, this universal experience in human form is a form of fiction. It's a story. Science can prove all of these things to us over and over and over again. But when we get down to the daily tasks of people live and people die and people lose their jobs and people gain their jobs and people are this and people are that, we never really apply the science to that. We only apply the science to medicine, and that's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. A good, we, get, we tend to get um, caught up when it has to do with health because we're always taught that relationships with our health, that illness is something that happens to us. It's not something that happens with us or for us. We always see it as something that happens at us or to us. So we tend to have a different, softer sense of compassion when it comes to health. So what if we looked at something other than health and we can see the projection of reality a little bit differently, okay? Um, now, if I gave um, two people a million dollars, now imagine one person had kind of never had anything or lost everything and never had anything and lost everything and never had anything and lost everything. And then the other person had maybe started out with nothing, but they, they worked and they persevered and they thought that things would get better and they were, had a feeling like they were going to become more consistently abundant and they took actions to create that consistent abundance. Now, I give both people a million dollars at the exact same time. Can we predict, based on what I just told you about their stories, Who's going to make something of that million and who's going to lose that million? We all know the answer. We all know the answer. One time I heard the stat about how many people lose their lottery winnings within two years of winning it. And it was something like 90% of all people lose that winnings by the end of two years. And the reason is not because they're stupid, but because they think, feel, and believe, and take actions based on their history. And then when those millions came in, there was no one there guiding them to fundamentally change what they think, to change what they feel, to change what they believe, and to change the actions that they take in order to make the millions their friend and their ally and something that they can 
live with happily and not have a negative experience with it or not revert back to the vibration they lived before it was handed to them. So it's very easy for us to kind of witness our relationship with the energy of money. But as soon as we take the same energy, thinking, feeling, believing, and actions, as soon as we take that same energy and we apply it to health, all hell breaks loose. And we all, oh, no, 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 it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. No, no, it's because, it, no, it's because of this or it's because of that. It's never because of this or that. It's always about our journey here as souls and how much we are aligned with soulful thinking, feeling, believing, and taking actions that are soulfully aligned. It's always about this. It's always about this. All right, I'm going to... Uh, do two things. I'm going to, number one, like look around at you guys and I can't see everybody at once, but I'll also scroll. So if anybody has a question, um, please raise your hand or type it in the chat room before we continue. Marty. Yeah. Okay. I heard. Mar oh, Marty. Okay, good. All right, Marty, I'm going to unmute you. Oh, he learned how to raise his hand. I did. A lot of good that did him, <laughs> since I still ignored you. Okay, so my question, my question is, how do I raise my hand? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know, I know you don't. <laughs> but you know what? I can give you a hug now that I see you personally. Yes. How, oh, I love you. I love you. <laughs> okay. So, what's your question? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, what I what I know is what's uh, what's helping me. Um, well, I know I feel amazing. I feel uh, excited about um, you know about um, being part of the creation of a future. My God, Whew. it's unbelievable. And what I what I know is, um, and even looking back, you know, at smaller situations because this is so big, um, big things help people focus. And instead of, instead of being random, you know, and kind of falling into that random energy of the, of the world, that, that operating program, um, you know, this, this thing has really helped me focus. And I noticed like, um, like at the last recession, whenever that was, my business did better. I always do better when the economy uh, was worse. So this is just like kind of a bigger, you know, a, a bigger event, but it's, but it's like that because I've never felt so focused, um, so um, peaceful, and so wanting to um, uh, help, you know, just wanting to to be uh, be of service, and I, you know, and and the greatest thing is um, having time to do it. Okay, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, I have to say, I agree with you. Um, I totally agree with you. I understand that. One of the things is that, you know. Um, when you have a higher vibrational energy, you don't necessarily experience the highs and the lows that would be more typical of people's reactions and response to the external. Because a lot of your life now is internally driven. So you've really shifted from the external to the internal. And that helps you to almost be immune to the volatility of what people are experiencing outside. But also, and being internally driven in order to become at peace with who you are, as you are, Marty, it means that you've integrated a lot of the positive principles of enlightenment to the point that your innate vibrational energy is so high to begin with that if you're not going through the volatility, then that means that you're staying at a pretty high plane. So what you're describing actually is the fact that you started from a position of a higher level of awareness than a lot of people may have begun with. I, I know in my client base, I often see um, people who feel like they have to act more scared or act more reticent or act more 
um, fear based than they really feel, but almost like as a political correctness to make others around them feel more comfortable. So it's sort of like, um, it seems like a, maybe a compassionate action to make other people feel like you're aware. And, and there are two ways of maybe not being as, as showing fear. One would be that you're just an idiot, right? <laughs> and have no awareness whatsoever. But the other is that your vibration is really high and you don't really feel afraid because of where you have learned to live. But when a person sees a person in public, if they're fear-based and they see you without a mask or you without doing the things that are expected, they're not going to ascertain the difference between whether you're just being an ass or you're being someone whose vibration is high enough that they are not brought down to the lower vibrations on the planet. So what you are describing and anyone that has felt anything that Marty is talking about, and I know a lot of my clients have, it's a testament to how far along the uh, uh, enlightenment journey you have come. And it's something to be proud of and something to see as solid. I can't tell you how many times in the last 10 years I've had a client who has, you know, keep, they kept rising and rising and rising. And then the third, and then the second something really crummy happens, they just fall. Well, it's because their words and their language and their thoughts were changing, but they weren't integrating those discoveries. So the moment something became difficult outside of them, the philosophy of enlightenment, the philosophy of awakening, the philosophy of what you think, feel, believe, um, and the subsequent actions that you take. It's, it, the words dissolve if you haven't brought those words into your being. So what you're seeing for sure, Marty, is that your relationship with enlightenment is solid, it's strong, it's unshakable. And truly, Enlightenment is a one-way road. It's a return to the consciousness of the state you lived in before you were born. So if you have integrated any enlightenment on any level, there is no turning back. There might be a revisit of past behaviors or attitudes, but usually it feels so disagreeable so quickly. Then we would grab whatever tools we had to get us through the first leg of the journey and get back to that reharmonization and that mindset and shifting ourselves back to recalling what we know eternally. So congratulations. You're one of those people I'm talking about, Marty, when I say now that we understand we're beacons and we know we're riding the wave, you're one of those people that's going to take what you think, feel, believe, and the subsequent actions that you take and make a contribution to others as they're trying to sort their way through these changes and some of these changes we really can't even begin to figure out how they're going to manifest in the physical but i agree that um you are basically immune to um all of the plummets that so many people have enlightenment is exactly that it lifts you above the gravity it lifts you above the graveness of being only human in earthly boots, if you will. Okay. So well done. But we all knew that about you anyway, Marty. <laughs> now we'll just see it more. <laughs> um, there's another question here. Can a person's vibrational energy change frequently or does it stay the same? A person's vibrational energy is simply how they were born. Everyone is a star when they're born. So it's at what vibration they were born at. So whatever they were born at, minus the masks and layers of misbelief in childhood, and you vibrate at a vibrational energy that's much smaller than what you were born at. If you had a really happy childhood, you're going to stay connected to how you were born. The more challenging or separated from the vibration of love your childhood was, the smaller your vibration will be as you get older. So there's two parts to your vibrational energy at any given moment. It's what you were born with, and then how many masks and layers you have. So a person can be born like that and have a really supportive childhood, and they can be vibrating higher 
than somebody that was born at that and has a lot of masks and layers, right? You understand? So um, a person's vibrational energy changes by removing misbeliefs. So your vibrational, vibrational energy can only increase when you remove pain, suffering, um, victimhood, the story that brought you down, the reflection of maybe not being unconditionally supported when you were younger, the myths, truths all around us, the bombardment from negativity, from the media, from culture, from community, sometimes from religions and so on. They create a lot of stuff that we carry. When you remove that stuff, your vibration increases. So a person's vibrational energy, it changes as they grow, as they integrate aha moments, as they remove their own masks and layers. For me, it was a very strong and strenuous and dedicated couple of years where I had to sort out all of the consequences of a very difficult childhood. So when I learned how to communicate with guides, they slowly helped me through the process without necessarily telling me what we were doing. But what we did was we helped me to reframe my childhood. They taught me how to understand the vibration of forgiveness, of acceptance, and of also seeing myself as not being flawed, that I was just holding on to the consequences of the challenges of childhood. So our vibration changes when we remove our masks and layers. And then after we get back to our original energy that we were born with, we can still expand beyond that after we peel off all the masks and layers by integrating more aha moments and having more profound wisdom that becomes us and we integrate into our being. Uh, when a person goes down, they're visiting human behaviors. They're visiting habits. Their innate vibrational energy never decreases. All they can do is live one place and visit old habits. Or as I was saying earlier, how people can have in their mind the philosophy of change, the philosophy of wisdom. Oh, I want to pet that cat. Aw. <laughs> Hi. Hmm. Aw. <laughs> So they can, they can, if they have the, the, this in their head and it's intellectual, but they haven't brought that wisdom into their being and it doesn't become a part of their essence, then they can appear to change their vibration simply because what they're saying and how they're living are not congruent, okay? Um, this is actually probably the, let's, Today's Monday, and I'm still going to say it's my most popular question of the week. That's how much I worked today. Is it disingenuous to wear a mask when going into a store knowing that you're immune, but revering um, those who are fear-based? I, I think there's a political correctness around illness, even if you yourself have no fear. A politically correct just to be a member of what appears to be caring society is to respect others' wishes and desires and where they live in fear in the collective. So I have even been, you know, pulling up, I wear these buffs all the time. I wear them around my neck and I commonly wear a buff around my neck. Uh, but even before people were wearing masks more commonly like they are now, I wouldn't hesitate to pull it up over my mouth and nose because I felt like it was respectful of not knowing where everybody else was living, okay? And it doesn't mean that we are acting afraid or taking in fear. It's simply being respectful. I don't see that any different than if you go to someone's house and they ask you to take your shoes off by the front door. Um, you take your shoes off. You don't say, my level of awareness is very clear that I'm not bringing dirt into your house and I'm not gonna deposit dirt into your space, okay? So I'm gonna wear my shoes and then walk in with them. It's kind of the same parallel and it's easier to see like that it's respect for where other people are living. Okay. Um, all right, I'm reading another one. If you go to the store, we are now asked to wear masks, mandated. I understand why it is being requested, but at the same time, I'm trying to not make it affect my positive energy level. I agree with Jeannie. Uh, again, I think it's easier to 
make it something a little more fun if you simply think of it as taking your shoes off when you go to someone's house and no one wears shoes in the house. It's just a matter of respect. Um, we have to be very aware of this, and this was something that I really wanted to talk to and put out there tonight. And we'll talk about it more over the next three sessions, but it's really important that we become aware that when I talk about deconstructing systems that don't work, if we help the systems that don't work tumble, we can rebuild systems that do work, but we can't always wait for other people to do it. Is that clear? I think a lot of times we sit on the sidelines because we don't feel like we have a lot of power when we vote. We don't feel like we have a lot of voice in anything, that we're over-legislated, we're over-governed, we're over-told everything to do. So we get quieter because we feel like we don't have a lot of power, we don't have a lot of voice. There's no better time dur during um, history than when things are already deconstructing anyway for us to rise up and use our voices to reconstruct in a manner that is soulfully connected. It's, it's something that is being handed to us on a silver platter. It's absolutely amazing how simple this could be to execute right now. A lot of things that I've been saying for 13 years, I would have to be mindful of my audience before I said it. I don't really think I have to be mindful of my audience at all anymore. Like, um, you know, maybe three years ago, I would have been uncomfortable to go into Dunkin Donuts and say, listen, you got to find me a cardboard cup or a biodegradable cup back there because I, I don't drink out of styrofoam. Um, I wouldn't have hesitated to, you know, I mean, I would have hesitated, uh, but now I wouldn't hesitate. You got to find me a car cardboard cup, you know, because everyone's thinking in terms of the collective now. Some people are turning it toward environmental, environmental concerns. Some are doing it from a a perspective of the economics of our circumstances and our situations, but we're all thinking with a little bit of a global lens on. And when we're thinking globally, we're actually thinking in terms of our eternal existence. So to care for each other and to care for the earth and to care for things that matter, which is that we are all, that we are all beautiful and we're all entitled to freedom and love and joy and lives as we want it and the liberty to do so we can push forward those principles now because things that were not necessarily supporting them are weaker than they ever were in the past. Now is the time to build things that are soulful. I'm still trying to figure out a harmonious way to do this, but I've told people that I would like to create an app where we are, are going to give like a soulful rating to organizations and businesses the idea is to help us decide where we put our money, but also to decide where we want to work, where we want to play, where we want to invest. So the higher heart rating a company would get, the more we would feel comfortable spending money, buying their services, buying their products, working there, suggesting other people work there, and, and maybe supporting them as investors. If we had a way to understand the soulfulness of companies, I think it would help all of those people who are beacons of positive possibility to use one resource that we have, money, another resource that we have, time, another resource that we have, passion, and to use those resources to reconstructing the way we want to live in this world. Um, so we might have to just start out ad hoc by maybe sharing stories of companies that do extraordinarily wonderful things that are soulful, but also being mindful of, of companies that are not respecting others or being supportive or being compassionate or being whatever else it is that we feel is soulful. Because sometimes when we share the stories, that's how we help to connect to reconstructing the world in which we want to live by taking away the resources from the organizations and the institutions that are not aligned with the way that we want to live, okay? So that's a possibility. Um, uh, Joe wrote here about wearing the, ma the masks. The, the term that came up in the last series, or I don't know when it came up, but I 
or maybe I wrote it in an essay, I can't remember, maybe I wrote it on Facebook, but the term that I got was compassionate observer. If we can see ourselves as compassionate observers, it helps us to stay in a place of harmony when other people are living in fear or in anger or in disempowerment. So you can observe, you can feel compassion, but it doesn't mean that you have to join their campaign, whatever disempowering campaign they personally are choosing to live in. It's so hard for people to basically understand that regardless of anything going on outside of you, happiness is a choice. I don't know why that keeps eluding everybody. Happiness is a choice. It's as fundamental as the sun will rise. Happiness is a choice. It was, it was taught to us, many of us, that you're not supposed to be happy if your neighbor is not. That is not true. If you are happier, there's a better possibility your neighbor will become happy too. So model that instead. Model harmony, model passion, model happiness, model possibility. Don't, don't go down, stay up. I, I was talking to someone the other day, and I don't remember who, but it was in a group, I think. And one of the things I mentioned was that I learned how to dance with my eyes in the last few weeks, okay? And what I mean by that is if I do pull this up and it's over my, um, my eyes and my nose like that, I've learned to smile in my eyes. I've learned to lock eyes with people. I've learned to make people feel my presence just through my eyes. But what we're, most people are doing is because they're so afraid and they don't know how to walk around with masks is they're isolating themselves by becoming invisible behind the mask. And they actually feel kind of good if they hear you speak or they see a smile in your eyes. We can project warmth through our bodies. We can project warmth through our voices. We can project hugs just by being one who cares. Um, last week, I had someone say how horrible it is to be out there because everyone's so cold and nasty and bitter and so on. Well, number one, we're not seeing anyone's smiles anymore because they're hidden. But number two, that's not my experience. Everywhere I go still, which is not that many places, but everywhere I go still, people are loving, they're kind, they're helpful. It's, to me, I'm like, oh my God, the world has become the place I want to live in. <laughs> but that might be because that's the energy I'm putting out there. I'm putting that positive energy out there. You know, I can be an observer, but it doesn't mean that I get so caught up in my own thoughts that I appear reticent or judgmental. I can appear like I'm still participating in the human experience. I know we're almost at eight o'clock, but there's one thing that I want to, uh, one of the key topics, uh, not topics, I just want to put it out there and give you a homework assignment about it. But I have to, I always get a little stuck. Someone's going to be laughing at me because I always forget how to, what's the easiest way to wipe down this board? Ah. <laughs> See, I could use that, that girl who wrote riding the wave of the tsunami seizes. I could really use her help now because she could have had this cleaned off for me and had it all fixed and she wouldn't get confused about how to do it like I do. All right. The homework assignment is, and feel free to share it with me, Karen. Uh, that's my email or on Facebook, Karen L. Garvey. Okay. So you can inbox me or share it by email because I will, like I did last time, I will put together an email of everybody's homework before the next class because sharing helps us develop more understanding of the frequency of how things happen, but it also helps us to open up our own view of ways that it's happening because we tend to um, see, you know, things the way we see them. But when we see the way other people see them, it expands us as well just by reading how they see them. Um, just reading those questions. Thank you.
Oh, hashtag soulful spending. That's a great idea. I'm going to, I'm going to think about that, Jennifer, and we'll have to talk about that. Maybe you can help me out. I don't understand hashtags. Well, maybe we can, maybe we can figure that out. Okay. Um, B Corps. What's that? Marianne, can I unmute you? I got to find you. Where are you, Marianne? I don't see you. Ah, I don't see you at all. Okay, well, just write it in here. May, or maybe you could tell me. I am here. Oh, okay, there she is. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Marianne, what's a B Corp? A B Corp is a company that, so I'm, I'm going to read to you what like kind of their, their baseline is. And it's, um, if you're a certified B Corp, we, en we envision a global economy that uses business as a force for good. Oh my God. Yeah, it's called, me? it's called, they're called B Corporations. I actually brought this up to a financial advisor I was using at one time. And I said to him, well, I want to invest in companies in B Corps. And he was oh, like, oh, wow. oh, no, 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 that doesn't make any money. And I was like, but why not? Oh, well, that, oh, is Marianne, a really that's cool amazing. thing to look into. Yeah, it's, it's a great um, philosophy. Um, it's a lot of small businesses, but it's, it's, a, it's kind of like towards a common global good cause okay that's what they have to I, I like that yeah all right i'm going to mute you again but we're going to revisit that definitely okay. okay i'm also going to put that in the homework when i send you out your homework um this week the collective homework that everybody sends me and i'll write i'll try to look something up about keep b corpse and i'll put that in there um kelly writes that app sounds like a a, a zagat's for soulful businesses yeah I, I like that. That's actually true. Uh, and before I make my last point, I just want to read this because this is probably nice. I saw you, Jackie. So hi, Jackie. Um, I did see you back there, but I didn't want to embarrass you by calling you out. Um, this is Jackie. Uh, my experience during this event has made me more grateful and very introspective regarding where I'm at and how important sending love to ourselves and others um, is and um, how beneficial that is. All right, good. This is all good stuff. Okay, so the thing that I want you to do for homework and to really think about, that's how it becomes a homework assignment is because you're really thinking about it. So what I want you to see is that one of the really positive possibilities of this um, downtime is that um, I, 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 I realize we have an amnesty period now. And an amnesty period means that we can be forgiven and we can forgive others for a lot of dumb shit, okay? Because when we actually get around to being together again, no one's gonna care that you yelled at my dog when he was barking. No one's really gonna care that you knew I was gonna wear a green dress to the wedding and you wore a green dress anyway. No one's gonna care that when my son came around selling um, Boy Scout cookies that you only bought one box instead of two. So all the petty little stuff that people have held on to. Um, we are going to have an amnesty period because we don't have enough energy now to be holding on to all of that petty little nonsense and getting on with rebuilding life. So what I say is look around and notice where people are making something softer, making something simpler, or even jot down where you feel your judgment of others is getting less or when you made a more soulful choice instead of how you might have been pre-virus, okay? So the idea is just let's find ways and share ways that you're witnessing or anticipating or seeing more soulful behavior because of this inevitable amnesty period that we're in and will continue, okay? I saw someone over there giving someone a head rub and like, that's just like so not fair because we're virtual and I can't get my head rubbed. <laughs> but carry on. <laughs> um, okay, so any other final questions? Type them out before we, oh, bcorporation.net. That's very, very helpful. Okay, uh, and email me your softer things that you're witnessing. It doesn't even have to be from you or it can be from you softer ways that people are behaving already as this amnesty period is beginning. Okay. Um, I was told that there's one more question that I must have completely Patty missed. Oh, somebody has her hand up. Um, Patty. Okay. Patty, you have your hand up. Just, um, yeah, let me just say hi. Okay. Go ahead. Patty. 
No, I was just saying hi. I didn't have a hand. Oh. <laughs> but you know hi. what? Hi. Everyone say hi to Patty. <laughs> but I will ask you, where did you get that piece? Did you buy that or did you make it? Your uh, this? Yeah. Oh, these, um, I'll show you what they're, my, the idea for them, it came from um, the, my family, a lot of them watch Survivor. And on Survivor, they use these buffs that can become a shirt or a hat or a mask or a neck warmer. And so when I um, took a trip to Iceland last year, I, I bought a dozen of them, all different colors, so that I could adjust to the different weathers because the, the climate change in a day in Iceland was pretty dramatic. So now I, I use them all the time and they're great because they just go in the washer and dryer and I, I use them constantly and I lend them to people and I use them and I lend them and I use them. Um, but I, I know Buffs, sorry, Buffs is the brand, but the brand is kind of pricey. I just, I just buy a less expensive brand. What is it? Buffs? Buffs, B-U-F-F. -F. That's the expensive brand. Well, maybe you have to patent it with yeah, soul. Maybe. Yeah. I, I use, as a matter of fact, uh, um, we just mailed one to my daughter in the city today because she's going through that compassionate observer thing where she's starting to get stared down in New York City when she's not wearing a, a mask. So we just uh, sent one off to her. <laughs> wow. Oh, I also wanted to say something in regard to our, um, how we make a contribution. I'm, I, I believe that enlightenment and the process of, of bringing us to a higher level of awareness on the planet, I believe that this is evolutionary, whereas every other period of major change in the world has been revolutionary. So number one, it's important that we respect the fact that we don't have to fight. We don't have to come from an energy of anger or aggression. There will be people that fight, there will be people that are angry, and there will be people that are aggressive. But one of the things about enlightenment is we understand we can bring about change through the vibration of love instead of beating it into people. And from that perspective, I see we have a lot of people on here tonight who live in New Jersey. And I haven't really stayed on top of the news, so I'm not quite sure if I'm accurate. But I want to just give almost as a metaphoric example of a way where we can reconstruct that which is not working. If I lived in New Jersey right now and my park system was closed down, that would be something that I would want to take evolutionary action toward shifting because there's so much evidence about how important mental health is and how important outdoor exercise and communing with nature is for spiritual and emotional and physical well-being. So the decision by egoic people that are sitting in an office somewhere justifying their own positions to close down the park system, in my opinion, it's short-sighted and it's limited. So this is something where we can actually have permission to use our voice and stand up for what we believe in, that it's important that we get back to living in harmony with our relationship with our body, with nature, with the outdoors, with freedom. Um, and closing the park system is the antithesis of some of the, some of the ways we can get reconnected to our own eternal wisdom and our own harmony. So since that, I just heard um, within the last couple of days that New Jersey closed its parks, I thought it would be a good tool just to show how we do have power if we use it. But we can use it wisely. Three quick sentences about mental health about the value taken from science, about communing with nature, and about the value of exercise. If everyone sent a few sentences to the key people who were responsible for decision-making about closing the parks, we could influence that outcome. And this is where I'm saying it doesn't have to be a revolution, but it can be an evolution that you can no longer make all of our decisions for us. We have a voice and we're going to use our voices. Okay. All right. So please email me uh, your, your homework because I have to tell you honestly from the last batch of homework, everyone benefits when they see other people's perspectives. It's so hard to look through our lens, but as soon as we hear what other people are saying and how they're witnessing it and what they're seeing, it really helps them to notice more for themselves. And it also helps them to pat themselves on the back. Because you might show how one person was less judgmental 
you write that in your homework and then all of a sudden, I don't know, gay is going to say, oh, I did that too. So you are also helping to develop a better understanding about how awesome we are by sharing. Okay. All right. I love all of you. I'm so happy I got to see your faces and I will see you on when, uh, Thursday, 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 seven, um, Eastern time. Good night, everybody.